Welcome to the Gray and Gold Podcast, Episode 9. My name is Graydon Square. And I am RK Gold, and we are one away from 10, y'all. One away. Hey, almost. And we're going to have something very, very special for you guys at the big 1-0. So. Yeah, and the special thing is we're shutting down. Sorry. Podcast is over. <laughs> Hope you didn't get too invested. <laughs> it, was too, it was a 10-episode experiment. It failed, and we're just going to go and live in a bunker somewhere. Absolutely. But it's going to be a creative bunker. Don't worry. I always wanted to ask you something. Were you ever in the improv at all? I auditioned for one improv troupe my freshman year of college. My girlfriend at the time said I am not funny. I did not get in and I dropped it. <laughs> you shouldn't have listened to her. You're pretty hilarious to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, she, she, she was pretty horrible. She lied about having cancer. Wow. I mean, that's just, wow. That's probably why she isn't your girlfriend girlfriend anymore, right? No, she cheated. That's why she's not my girlfriend anymore. <laughs> oh, well, I thought the lying about cancer <laughs> thing would do it. But, you know, I guess if there needed to be something else over the top, then, you know. I was uh, 18. Well, no, I was 17 when we started dating. And I was just really excited to be um, talking to a girl who thought I wasn't ugly. Yeah. I think a lot of boys are you know they have that attitude where it's just like i'm just i'm just happy to bask in the glow and i think it, it i'm sure that does a lot of damage for a lot of kids too because they don't really develop the social skills to destigmatize you know gender relations and then you create these kind of socially awkward you know kids in their adulthood who now are tasked with trying to find a mate and create a family and all the things that come with that and you just wonder like if you don't pick up those skills early on, you may never actually pick them up. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, I mean, it, we, we do sort of have a lot of adults who just really struggle, ta and I, I can say this quite confidently because I am one of them, really struggle talking to the opposite sex or or the same sex if that's what they're into. But um, mm -hmm. they, they just really struggle, struggle talking to someone who they might be romantically interested in. Um, they like they really cannot differ those relationships um in their head and it's it's, it's either like w once the idea of something beyond friendship enters their mind they just shut down <laughs> and you know what's interesting and and that for a lot of people you know i i get it you know it, it's everybody is not going to have the same type of uh nurturing scenario when they're coming up <clears throat> but what you're talking about is for people without baggage Imagine people who are trying to find relationships with, you know, PTSD type baggage from their childhood or from a traumatic experience that they've had or, you know, whatever it may be. It's like the dynamic of, you know, pair bonding and, and dating dynamics and, and courtship and all that stuff. A lot of that stuff is informed by how we're raised and the things that we do, the things that we're willing to do in order for to, to achieve companionship, I think is informed by what we're exposed to and what we're taught when we're younger. Yeah, just look at uh, what you and Brandy coming out episode, or this episode nine, so last episode. Yep, last episode. Um, yeah, what you and Brandy talked about uh, as far as growing up in dysfunction and thinking that that's normal is concerned. I mean, if, if you were to hypothetically have gone from that and right out of the gate dated someone from a suburb whose worst experience was missing the school bus once, um, th th there, there would not necessarily be a lot of connection there, uh, a, a lot of empathy. The, the relationship would not be able to flourish. Um, and you probably both would have no idea why, you just would, you wouldn't connect. I totally agree. And, and there have been people who have told me, you know, you, you probably weren't psychologically in the place to be able to be uh, a functional companion in a relationship in that way based on the stuff that you had went through so <clears throat> i say that to say you know we have a part not only in the last episode <clears throat> but in this new episode coming up where we talk about baggage and i think it's always interesting to try to unpack your own baggage and this is if you're doing it absent any type of uh um in you know psychedelic influences if you're into that sort of thing or if you know you're you're self-medicating with marijuana or cannabis or something like that there's a lot of self -refle self reflection to be done and i i hope that people are taking this time such a weird time in human history probably the strangest time in the last 
200 years for sure. Uh, taking this time to really do some self-reflection because, you know, you think about that sort of stuff when, when you start to unpack some of the stuff we're talking about, gender dynamics and dating and all that stuff. Well, can I also just say that slight pivot on topic, but built around the same philosophy. Yeah. I do think that self-reflection and self-awareness are two incredibly important and incredibly underdeveloped skills. Um, and I say underdeveloped is in like not prioritized in education whatsoever uh, skills that people growing up have to have to come to terms with. Um, and it could be something like you lack the self-awareness to understand how to pursue a romantic relationship. It could also be with what we're doing right now with content creation. One of the top pieces of advice you hear from a content creator is be authentic. And one of my first answers every time is what the fuck is that? You're telling me to be myself and all I have been my entire life as a consumer. I don't know what I am. You tell yeah. me to be myself. I might just end up quoting Tony Robbins because I accidentally watched one of his YouTube videos at two o'clock in the morning um, and then fell down this rabbit hole. And then I don't have an identity outside of the YouTube recommended video list. Interesting. So I've heard that before too, right? Even before, and this relates, I think, to both of our careers, being told to be yourself, be authentic, be unique. But I was told that in a time where I felt like that was appreciated. I feel like today is a different time. I feel like today, people want you to walk, walk lockstep with other ideas and, and brands and, and other you know, uh, people a lot more than they want you to be authentic and do your own thing. I've found that people have kind of shamed people for being unique and doing their own thing as uh, being closed minded in a lot of ways. So where do you think that balance is and, and how do you think people should should look for that balance? I think it's a scary balance because you being quote authentic, as you just said, usually means being just like your six closest friends. Um, and it can be really difficult to come to the realization that if you disagree with them, even on something minor now, they might not want to be friends with you at all. Yep. Did and, you see my last, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Did you see my last Facebook post? No, I did not. I but, based, okay. I, no, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of not knowing my identity, I'm friends with you on Facebook and now all of your friends on Facebook, even though we have one connect, I'm like, oh shit. So, so now my identity is sci-fi. Like I see this guy popping up. Yeah, anyway, oh, continue. Uh, no, for sure. On my, on my Facebook page, I posted something about that when you said, uh, you know, people aren't willing to be your friends anymore if you disagree with them on one thing. I see this thing on Facebook now. I'm sure you've seen this. It says, when someone will post something that goes a little something like this. They'll say, <clears throat> if you like X, then just go ahead and unfriend me right now. And it's like, I don't even know what the ultimatum is, but I'm just going to unfriend you. Like, I don't want to be around people like that. And then there will be people who will say, well, yeah, but, you know, what if they're, they believe something that's really ridiculous and, and they, you know, yeah, I get that. There will probably be people out there who will be a friend on my Facebook friends network who will probably believe something that I would consider ridiculous. But that's not going to be the reason why I choose to not be their friend. I'll choose to not be their quote unquote friend if they are, you know, some type of troll or they don't know how to communicate what they're talking about. And they just do it abrasively and they don't have the, the, the social IQ to communicate their ideas. But if, even if you're a flat earther, right? Let's just say you're a flat earther and we're friends. I'm not going to unfriend you because you're a flat, flat earther. Now, if you inundate me every day with reasons why the earth is flat and I tell you, bro, I don't believe this and you know, I don't want to keep being sent this. And if you keep doing it, it's like, okay, then I'll just remove you. So to me, I feel like, and, I, and like I said on, on, about Facebook, you see it more on social media than anything where you can unfriend people. But I wonder what that is, where we're kind of open about telling people we want to be in echo chambers. Well, I will say it's interesting you bring social media into it because I do feel like social media, each one serves a different purpose. And I understand curating your space differently on each one. Like, I don't hide this. I hate Trump. Uh, if someone is sharing nothing but pro-Trump shit on Facebook, I'm going to unfriend you. I don't want to see that on Facebook. I don't go on there for that. Um, if I see them doing it on Twitter, I probably won't unfollow them. I give more leeway to Twitter. I, I think Twitter is, is the land of outrageousness. And if you post anything remotely close to being political on Instagram, you get an immediately uh, unfollow from me because Instagram is meant just to look at beautiful people and beautiful places and beautiful animals. You know what? I think we align on that. If I'm on Instagram 
and I see you post like hella political shit. I don't care if you're on the left or the right. Even if I me. agree with it. Yeah, like, even if I agree with it. It's like, I'm not trying to see that on Instagram. I'm trying to see star citizen pictures. I'm trying to see, uh, you know, I'm trying to see stuff like that. So like post your crazy shit on Twitter where we can be crazy together. We go to Twitter to lose our minds. We go to Instagram to meditate. Right, right. And it's different because Twitter has become the public platform for people's personalities. Facebook's have, Facebook has become people's uh, echo chambers. But you could say that about Twitter as well, because most people probably- I would say Twitter that. is quite an echo chamber too. It's just, it has the, um, it, it has the one, it, you could say advantage or disadvantage of everything you're posting is public. You don't have to be, fo- unless you specifically private it, you don't have to be following that person to see it. Whereas Facebook, if you post something on your feed, it's not like some random person from Arkansas is going to be like, what's this kid up to today? <laughs> what do you think about uh, the, people will say that social media doesn't make us very social at all. It makes us kind of antisocial and it pushes us further apart because people forget how to communicate with any type of nuance or uh, you know levity or anything like that. What do you what do you think about what social media is doing to our ability to communicate? Depends on the person. Like, per, not to size myself up, but I I, I think that, and I, I know I'm not even going to phrase it that way because I really don't want to compliment myself on air. Uh, but I do think that you can use social media to be social. Like Discord is social media, and I feel like that in your community, people are very social, getting to know each other. Like I would be surprised if I heard people in your community were sending each other Christmas cards um, on LinkedIn. I've personally grown my business by connecting to everyone in New Orleans that has business owner, CEO, executive director, like basically anyone I can find who lives in New Orleans with those, with those titles, I send a connection request out to them. And the first thing I do is I try and schedule a coffee with them because I don't want them just to be names on a screen. I want to actually meet them and hear their story. Now that is connection through social media. I think that you can absolutely use social media as a tool to be social, but you have to be deliberate about it. Because the flip side is you can use social media the same way we used to use television, only it's with um, thoughts of people who aren't being paid money to, to spread their nonsense. You can go on there and strictly be a consumer, strictly read all of the most ridiculous threads, um, maybe comment here and there, but you're not creating any real connections. And on top of that, you're doing it anonymously. Mm, yeah, anonymity. I, I, and I think that... And this, this is a sweeping generalization. I understand that I could be completely wrong, but I do think that if you are going on social media um, anonymously to make outrageous claims, I mean, even, even if your argument is, um, I understand that these are outrageous and I understand uh, that I need to be anonymous to protect myself so I can say them publicly without getting harassed. I do think that you're handicapping your ability to be social on that platform because how much can you really get to know someone um, if all they see is your avatar and numbers after, after random letters on a screen and the fact that you both agree that the world is flat. So the world of flat thing is pretty interesting because I have a belief as to why <clears throat> there's been an uptick in flat earthers. Uh, there's been an element of <clears throat> flat earth belief uptick, in my opinion. I never used to see it on uh, YouTube. I never used to see flat earth I'm not going to call it propaganda, but just videos uh, where they're challenging the idea of, you know, the earth being round, uh, round celestial systems. And so I think people like that who claim they believe in outrageous stuff like that are doing so more for attention because we give them attention. If you come out right now and say, I believe the world's flat, there's probably going to be more articles on you saying that than saying, hey, I'm a professional in this field and I think I'd be able to serve you in this field. And if you're interested, you should probably come check me out. I would agree. I think attention is currently one of the most valuable uh, currencies we have and people understand that. Um, and you can make more money being completely outrageous and garnering five, like not even five, garnering 0.5% of the people who see your posts as diehard fans than you can being rational and uh, getting no diehard fans or an even smaller number, but, um, and, and not to mention a smaller reach as well, because no one's going to follow you just for saying something that makes sense that everyone else believes in. Um, unless you, unless you put like ridiculous amounts of, um, Joker face paint on or just something out, outrageous. Uh, that but being you, but said, you said it though, you got, it's gotta be outrageous. It can't be normal. 
Which goes back to authenticity as well, I guess. It's like, what is being authentic? I, I guess maybe in terms of that, being authentic would be admitting to yourself that you are attention hungry and rocking that. Uh, but that being said, I, going, going back to Flat Earth, I have noticed an uptick in it as well. Um, I think part of it is the, the echo chambers created by social media, where if you just follow and like one thing that talks about maybe not trusting the government, it can lead you down a rabbit hole of conspiracies. Um, hmm because it wants to keep you engaged with what you have now signaled to these devices that you're interested in. Um, and next thing you know, you're believing these articles. I also think some of it just comes from less of truly believing the world is flat and more of just distrusting the government. I mean, I agree. I, I, America is founded on this principle of, of distrusting of large entities and NASA being a government program. I, I think that it's just a love of distrusting the government uh, or, or not even a love, just a need, an obsession, a compulsion to distrust anything that has ever come out of the government's mouth, collective mouth, uh, needs to be either discredited or questioned. Yeah. And I definitely think that there's some some merit to questioning your government, right? Because no, the, you, the official state line should always be questioned by, you know, uh, independent investigators and scrutinized by skeptics so that you know, people with agendas don't slip their BS through. So I definitely appreciate that. But I think that, go, like you said, it goes a little bit further where there's a compulsion to irrationally discredit things that for the most part should be rationally accepted. Like, okay, for the most part, I don't think that this government would be working with other governments to keep the knowledge that the world is not flat away from the rest of the world. That seems like such a great leap of logic to me. That's not to say that it couldn't possibly be true, but I'm just going to take the field on that, <laughs> that claim. Well, it's, it goes back to the, the Bible discussion that we had recently with an unnamed guest, uh, or, or should we name them? Uh, I think I, I, I actually spoiled it earlier. I think I said his name earlier in the chat so, or in the conversation, so we, I may have already spoiled it. Well, I mean, it is, as far as like putting the burden of, of making an outrageous statement and putting the burden of finding your way to believe it on the consumer and saying like, look, this is the absolute truth. And I don't care what mental gymnastics you go through to find your way to the truth, but it's your responsibility to find it or we're done here. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of pressure when you do that to a young mind. You know, uh, if you're they don't 12. see the logic, they see the person, they see the authoritarian figure who they desperately crave that sort of, whether it be paternal or like, yeah, paternal figure to them. Validation. Or they Validation from, from, from someone older and wiser, a mentor um, going completely off topic. I do think the lack of mentor and apprentice uh, relationships has stunted growth um, in some way. Like, I understand this is a good sweeping generalization. I also understand that we'll, I, we get hate a lot more for our feminist discussion on the last podcast than this. But I think that the idea of, um, I'm 28 right now, and there are people out there who would still refer to me as kid. And I'm not talking about like some 60-year-olds so like looking back saying, oh, shut up, kid. I'm talking about like contemporaries referring to me as kid. It's like, no, I'm, I'm a 28-year-old man. I, I just because like you have to go through this growth, which I actually listened to a Jordan Peterson uh, interview once um, where he was talking about the need for, for mentorship. And he said, you grow up with your parents and they are the figures who are teaching you. You go off to learn. And I, what used to happen is your parents would be replaced by the mentor or the master. And it could be in martial arts. It could be the sensei in carpentry. It could be the master who gives you the diligent work as an apprentice. It could be, it could be in trade schools with an electrician or a plumber, or it could be a professor at a college who replaces uh, your parents and becomes that figure who challenges you academically. You and see it in, in uh, athletics. Yeah. In athletics, you see it with a coach. You absolutely do. And the lack of that transition from the parents to a new figure who is supposed to, like parents are supposed to protect you and then this new figure is supposed to train you in, in, in this interview. That's basically what it was. And it, it, it was basically like you start off in, I guess the best way I can say it, there's this pool and then there's this narrow tunnel and then there's this pool again. And it's, it's your family life, it's the training, and then it's the adult life. And we have not been forcing ourselves through. And I understand our listeners cannot see the visual that I'm doing, but let me tell you, it is, it is beautiful. <laughs> um, but basically, we, are not we have a lot of people who are not being challenged through the trial and errors of that tube before reaching the adulthood. They just go from 
pool of a child to pool as an adult, they have not had any opportunity to shape themselves or be shaped by a mentor figure that they're just sort of floating in the nebulous as, am I still a kid? Am I still an adult? What is going on? And what they would replace that mentor, that one-on-one -on -one mentorship that they may have gotten from, let's say, you know, blacksmith training or whatever, uh, that they would be an apprentice at. Like, most people feel like I can have several people that I learn from by just the, the convenience of technology. And they can say, well, I can watch Tim Robbins, I can watch Gary Vee, I can watch all these different mentors. But what they really don't get is that you're seeing cross sections of what they want you to see. You're seeing slices and snippets of what they want you to see, how they want you to see it. When you were with your, your master as the apprentice in the old days or the olden days, whenever this, you want to apply this, you got to see the flaws in the master as well. You were right up close and personal. He wasn't like a perfectly presented human being. He wasn't, he didn't have it all together or she didn't have it all together. Uh, uh, they weren't the kind of uh, perfect modicums of society. A lot of times they had checkered pasts and flawed histories and broken families and all that type of stuff. So I also feel like not just a mentor, but a human mentor, someone that's going to show you, not only am I going to teach you how to do this job, but I'm also human and I fall short of you know the glory of whatever you want to place out there right and and i feel like there is an element of of understanding that comes with that that you don't get when you're watching it on the internet when you're watching it on youtube when you're watching lectures that you can't be at people you can't talk to uh, conversations you can't directly have you're getting a one-way uh, stream of information i completely agree i think that strive for perfection is a is a fallacy which has been uh, exacerbated thanks to social media thanks to platforms that we love like instagram where people are trying to put on this show of a perfect life where they never have made a single mistake and in reality humans just that we we aren't that and we feel like anything less than perfection now is complete failure um i i think that as you mentioned having that flawed human mentor is important because one of the things they teach you to do is fail that's exactly right. And we, and that's, you hit the nail right on the head right there. We have not taught our children. I was barely taught how to fail. I still feel like I suck at failing. And if you want to get good at anything, first thing you better get good at is failing because you're going to have to go through a lot of that to get good at whatever you're trying to get good at. Can we please share that story right now about, oh, about your music? Because yeah, yeah. I think this is the perfect story for <laughs> learning how to fail and how your life could have been so different if you did not learn how to fail. Absolutely. So shout out to uh, the homie. Uh, uh, I'm not going to dox him, but I'll, I'll give his, uh, his, his musician name. His name was Three Grand. We served in the military together. And, you know, he was, when we were coming up at the time, I was trying to do a bunch of different things. I wasn't good or great at one specific thing. I was good at a lot of different things, recording, production, rapping, but I wasn't great at any one thing. I didn't focus at any one thing. So when me and him linked up, I was in my early 20s. I was barely 20. I wouldn't even, yeah, I wasn't even 21 yet. So I hadn't gone to Iraq. I turned 21 in Baghdad. But we would work on music together. together. We were both rappers and we would record in the barracks. I had a little studio set up in the barracks. And, you know, we would record all the time and we had all these different songs. Well, one day there was going to be a get together on the third floor. I lived on the second floor at the time and everybody would come down to my room to do the recording and the, the writing and the rapping and stuff. And then people would go party on the third floor with other people. So one of the days we knew there was going to be a get together and there's going to be playing music. And this would happen to be one of the days that we were working on music ourselves. And so the song we were working on, we thought it was banging, right? We thought it was like, oh, this song is ill. Everybody's going to like it. We're going to play it and we're going to blow up on post, right? We thought we were going to blow up on the bass. So, I mean, not really after 10, 15 minutes after we've kind of listened to it for the 50th time by ourselves and we've tried to mix it and everything. We're like, all right, let's go up there and, and, and you know, get, get our love. Let's get, our, get our, our fan appreciation. So we go up there and, you know, we walk in and it's a packed packed room and in those barracks rooms you probably fit about 15 20 people right because it's a room 
So everybody is kind of in the different rooms and, you know, people are drinking and stuff and they got the normal kind of club radio music going on. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to kill it because the dudes on the radio are whack right now anyway. I asked the homie whose room it is because this is radio. You won't be polite and everything. I'm like, yo, man, can I put on some music after this song, after the CD plays? He's like, sure, man, I don't care. I'm drinking, you know, I don't care what you put on. So I'm like, all right. So people are vibing to the music that's playing. And I'm not really feeling it because I'm just me. I'm a weirdo. And me and the guy who, me and 3000, the guy who basically did this song, we thought that as soon as we put this in, people are going to be like, yo, man, this is dope. You know, uh, when did you guys do this? We love it. When you guys do something? We thought we were going to get all the adoration in the world. So the song ends and I take the guy's CD out. And I remember it like it was yesterday, no question. I put the CD in, I close it, play the song. Within like seven seconds, it was about between five to seven seconds. It probably felt longer than it was. I'm going to assume it was about seven seconds. The party erupted. What the fuck is this? Oh, this is terrible. This is trash. Who is this? Before I could even defend myself. It was like, ah, oh, this is trash. This is butt. Like people were really like just killing just destroy like all my dreams of being a rapper and a famous dude on stage and oh no nah, they just blew that out the out the back it was nothing and so before i even had a chance to defend myself i had already had the steam taken out of my sails and it was like a, a legitimate kick in the chest you know people always talk about it, it feels like a punch in the gut no this was a kick in the chest because i really really could not comprehend how all those people could not like my music at the time. I was so self-absorbed and in my own bubble that I couldn't understand that they weren't going to like it because it was just the wrong tone for the, I think back on it now, if I showed you that song, I'm gonna send you that song. Imagine a party and I'm gonna send you the song we played and you're gonna be like, why the hell would you play this? <laughs> so that was my initial first time experience where people who didn't know it was me People who didn't know that I was the person that they were judging gave me a judgment absent of their bias, absent of their trying to nicety it up or anything like that. They completely wrecked it. And I was glad that that happened because right when that happened, I looked at three and I was like, yo, man, let's get out of here. And we took the CD and we went downstairs and we started working on a new song. And we never stopped working on music until we kind of went our separate ways. But he experienced that with me. And I remember if you asked him about that to this day, he'd probably tell you like, yeah, that really, Gray was really destroyed over that. And it turned me into a dude, I feel like with a, a lot thicker skin so that when I started doing music about religion and, and um, politics and stuff, and I started getting criticism, it was easier for me to take those barbs because of that particular incident and a few others. But like I got booed off stage one time in Wichita, Kansas. Like, that was a, a whole nother thing that's a, a story about sucking that I feel like most people don't know. If you want to hear yeah, that. Cause I, I've only known you as like great and square, the multi-million streams a year rapper. I, I, I like, it's tough to imagine great. The uh, 20 year old kid walking up to a party with his chest puffed out and walking away with his chest sunken. Um, I do think that one thing that stood out to me there from that story was, you didn't even give yourself a day to just like uh, wallow. You, you went right back and started recording again. It was my revenge. My music was my weapon for a long time. You know, Fela, Fela Kuti, my favorite artist of all time in any genre, Fela, Fela Anukalapu Kuti. He was a Nigerian Afrobeat. He's basically inventor of Afrobeat, right? And Fela has a, a documentary called Music is the Weapon. And in that documentary, he talks about changing from a person who did music about just kind of partying and, and setting the vibe to being something more political and something more of a means to change things. And when I, I went through that experience, it changed what my purpose for my music was. It was no longer just about my therapy. It was how I was going to use this to affect people in a positive way. And, and I think that's why I changed directions and I pivoted so quickly. I didn't allow that that rejection or that denigration of that first attempt to to uh prevent me from keep to, to keep trying to stifle that growth i feel like i feel like it helped me grow instead of hurting yeah i i completely think that's 
it, so basically what you're saying is what well, you did have music mentors you just didn't know them personally well and then i met my one of my music mentors personally right like so in the early ages of the internet for those who don't know cannabis the rapper not the, the you know that's right you did study under cannabis briefly yeah i did and well, not even briefly a few couple of years uh i would say it was more like a year and some change uh where we were actually dealing with each other and we went on tour for a couple months in canada and and you know performed at a couple shows together i think it was like three three shows we did together and um i think that that experience with him especially when i was on tour with him and i got a chance to you know meet other artists who were kind of premier amongst their demographic right there were some pretty dope dudes in that basement that night for all the people who were there in uh toronto where that that cypher went down uh whoever was there they know about it but cannabis did this thing where he was talking about all of his students and the people who had directly been inspired by him and he was like this dude he was point he was going down the line he was like this dude's a monster this dude's a monster this dude's a killer and then he got to me and he was like but this dude and 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 i'm not gonna go into kind of what he said because i feel like it's kind of douchey to like just go into that specifically but you he basically text it to me and i'll slice you up <laughs> yeah well basically it says something like yo man out of all the dudes that i've heard that you know was inspired by me directly you seem the most apt to kind of take what i brought and took take it and ran with and run with it intellectually and i felt honored that he kind of tapped me in that way that with the intellectual tapping as opposed to uh, just saying, oh, his lyrical skill is above. Because there was a lot of dudes that there that night who had lyrical skill. But I think what he was most intrigued by and what he most fostered was my intellect and the technical abilities. We rarely talked about technicals. Sometimes, every now and then we talked some technicals, but for the most part, it was either theory or philosophy. And for those who don't know, rhyme theory is when you're just breaking down just the very concept of soft rhymes and hard rhymes and you know schemes and stanzas and metaphors and similes and why use this word over that word like that's theory technicals is more like breathing and cadence and structure and all these more blue belt and purple belt things that you may have to learn as opposed to when you get them to the brown and black belt level of this it's all theory <laughs> it's mostly just theory. There's very few hard rules. Eminem showed that you can essentially just dismiss all the hard rules once you get to a certain level and you can just go all soft rule or no rule at all and still be dope. And I do think that you just touched on, th th there are two ways that I feel like we could take this. I'll start with the one though. Do you feel like emulation is important for someone who, like at the white belt level, hypothetically, before they even know what they want to do? Uh, just because the way I see it is when you first pick up an instrument, when you first pick up a, a guitar, yeah, you could, you could practice the scales all day, every day, but you're going to get a lot further if you find a band and you try and, and you try and teach yourself their songs and play their covers. Are you um, though? Are you? Yeah. Cause that, cause you're, you're, I mean, aren't you? I don't know. I don't necessarily know if that's true, bro. The well reason... then here, I'll, I'll, I'll add on that metaphor. Okay. You go, you get your MFA in painting. You're going to go to school and you're going to learn how to paint like the Renaissance. Okay, that, that's a much more, that's an analogy that I can, I can understand. I feel like with the band example that you gave, though, to me, you would have to be around people who recognize that you needed to get better. If you just go and, and link up with a group of people who also suck at rapping, you're not going to know you suck. And so I was glad that I was around people early in my, everybody I was around when I was younger as a rapper were better than me. And I heard it often. It was like, oh, yeah, this guy, he's the best rapper in the crew. And I wasn't the guy they pointed at. So it was like a little barb, like, well, if you want to be the best dude in the crew, you better work on it. <laughs> you better be at home writing those lyrics because one of these days they might point to you and you may have to prove yourself. And I think that's, in, that, that's being ready and being prepared is just as important as being chosen or being tapped. So I appreciate what, what Cannabis, the, the lessons and the instruction he gave to me. And I think that to answer your question directly, the emulation is important because in the early stages, like you said, in the white belt stages, because even before you put on that gi and you put on a white belt, what's the first thing you do? You emulate. You see a martial artist, you see Bruce Lee and you go, ah, you know, you, you do what he did. 
and you think, okay, if I only do what he did, I can be what he was. And no, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, but emulation is, is, is paramount. And if you listen to my earliest work, my earliest, even before I was grade and square, my name was Apocalypse. All my stuff is Apocalypse. I sounded just like Canvas. So I'll hear students today who will send me stuff or people who aren't my students, people who are just inspired by me and they'll send me stuff and it will sound like me. And I have to remember like, oh, damn, I've been doing this for 15 years. There's going to be people now who are inspired by what I did and will emulate me until they gain their feet. The first song I ever wrote wasn't a song I wrote. The first song I ever wrote was a song that was already written and I just changed certain words and I realized that the words I was changing, I was matching the syllable count in each word I was changing. And so for me to, to learn how to rap, I had to learn how to pretend to rap like other people. So if you're an artist, if you're a painter, yeah, you want to emulate the great painters, the Monets, the Picassos, the, the you know, Leonardo da Vinci's, whoever. You want to make sure you at least pretend to try to be like them so that you at least can get your creative uh, dexterity, your, your, your creative fluidity. It can be something that you don't seem so stiff when you're trying to do things that they would normally do. Now, you're not going to be like them. I don't expect you to throw a one-inch punch and knock a dude over a chair. But you understand the mechanics of what he did and given enough training you may be able to put yourself in a position where you can come close to that. And I think that's what's important. And that's so, sort of what I was getting at too. I feel like the emulation stage and period um, is important. I feel like I, I suffered from not giving it enough credit because sort of like what Ian brought up when he was on the show, um, I think emulation teaches you the technical abilities while also starting to cultivate a fan base because you, uh, people like familiarity um, to an extent because um, it's, it's comfortable. And with, for example, what Ian said, he knew a lot of comic artists who blew up because they started posting fan art right, of, right. of already existing shows. And then that also, and like how he got his Adventure Time job because he finally started posting fan art of Adventure Time. And somebody was like, hey, you do this better than the guys we got. Come through. Oh, yeah, or, or equally as good. I mean, I think his was better. But yeah, like, or, like you, you do this competently. We want to bring you on. So I, I do think the emulation period is important. Now, the other period, uh, which is something I want to touch on because something you brought up was how you finally transitioned to this realm of success in music. And it was that you made yourself a thought leader. Um, you, 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 you did the, you, you basically laid down, these are my beliefs. You found that authenticity, which people always say, if you want to be successful, you have to do you planted your flag and then people who wanted to fuck with you knew exactly what you stood for with this music and wanted to fuck with you. I remember. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's pretty accurate. I, I remember in 2010 when I started naming songs after search terms. So like I named a song black atheist because I knew there were people searching Google for black atheist. So it was that's like, brilliant. I, Oh, it's not my idea. I wish I could take credit for it. Uh, that's just a guerrilla kind of guerrilla marketing that I, I read some in some book somewhere. It was like how to guerrilla market. There were things they were telling me to do stuff like put a video up, name it like a popular artist and then put your video there so that you inflate your numbers. Even if you get ratioed, you get put into the algorithm. And I was like, I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> like, I mean, I could see a person doing that on some hardcore guerrilla guerrilla stuff, but I'm not doing that. My, my buddy running for uh, Congress, uh, he got completely ratioed on YouTube because there was this really, uh, it was when the Met, he went to University of Maryland with me. That's how we met. And there was this University of Maryland men's basketball, I think it was like running man challenge or some shit like that. And mm -hmm. it went viral. And he capitalized on the viral video by uh, taking their video, putting his own adaptation of the song over it and putting himself in some of the videos and just like posting it as, look, they're dancing to my song. And just everyone went there to show him hate, but he still got like about like tens of thousands. Um, and I think he actually made broke a hundred thousand views. Wow. So is it worth breaking a hundred thousand views or a million views? If you're getting ratioed and the people actively say, Hey, you're, you're, you're being dishonest here in this way. Like, and it may even not be dishonest. It may be just a manipulation because I feel like they're being dishonest by only suggesting you things algorithmically that you look for. Like, I feel like that's a form of dishonesty because that's not what not people sure. are doing. 
I'm, I'm not sure if it's a good or bad idea for one. I can, I can say that I feel like we've already established that earlier on that attention is one of the most valuable currencies a person can have currently. Mm-hmm. Um, and once you get that attention, then the burden falls on you to allocate it properly. Um, so he has, he's, he's unique. His name is Paperboy Loves Prints. Um, we should get him on the that, show. I want to talk to him legal, about that. And that's his legal name. And he's, he's unique because basically he's, he's a content monster. Now, his, he doesn't do numbers per se always, but he's putting out multiple pieces of content a day and has been for like almost a decade now. Um, fucking monster as far as quantity is concerned. And he, he'll completely disappear and get clowned on for like a year and won't stop. And then next thing you know, he's getting write-ups in every major publication. He got signed by Azalea Banks' um, uh, label briefly. I don't know what happened with that. It would mm-hmm. be a question to ask him. Mm-hmm. But he's just one of those guys that does not stop. Um, now, I don't know if that has worked. Like, like he, he, He's someone who got clowned on. The next thing I know, he's chilling with Shia LaBeouf. Um, Interesting. So- but, but, but here's the thing about that. You probably have to go through a significant amount of clowning before you reach that type of stuff, right? You, you're going to have to have extremely thick skin to deal with the barbs and the shots you're going to take for doing what you believe in. That's counter to the normal culture. He swerved into the clown a little harder, and I'm wondering if that helped or hurt him. Because like this is someone who has a Game Boy tattoo on his chest. Um, or no, he has a pizza slice tattoo on his chest. He wears a Game Boy chain. Like when you, like when He dresses up as a fairy godmother because he's a street performer. Like That's, that's the way he transitioned. Um, so I don't know, like, I honestly can't tell you if it, like, I cannot tell you what I would have done if I was him. I know he started off as a very traditional rapper who, in my opinion, had some of the best bars that I had heard. Um, and he, Hey, coming he, from you, that means a lot. You told me I had some of the best away. bars, so I, I appreciate well, that. Well, this, this is going, like, I mean, the fact that I still remember this, and uh, last time I heard him rap something like this was maybe 2014, maybe, okay. uh, because then he, like, fully changed. Uh, he like he he became heavily as far as going back to our conversation on finding a mentor. He he found Lil B and fully went the Lil B route. Oh, I see. Um, because he he saw the opportunity there. So I, again, I, I guess I'm really uh, rambling and stuttering over myself right now because I don't know what he could have done differently, or I know he could have done a million things differently, but I don't know if it would have helped hurt or if if this is just what he's been destined to do to come in waves to to blow up one year, disappear for three, blow up one year, disappear for four, blow up two years, disappear for 10. Let me ask you this question, and I guess I, we can close it out on this. But, you know, how do you think that you are able to reach your maximum creative ability without a mentor? Do you think people genuinely think that without a mentor or without a master, that they can reach the peak? Because my example is I have a student and I'm not just gonna name the student's name because I'm not trying to, to name drop like that, but I don't I'm believe- I'm to hear it off air. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that this student would have reached their maximum potential had it not been for me. Now, could they have? Absolutely. And could they have reached an even greater potential? Sure. But it is up to, in my opinion, the, the, in, the instructors and the mentors and the masters to bring the best out of their pupils and students. That is their function. Master Ip's function was to bring the Bruce Lee out of Bruce Lee. Otherwise, he would have just been some kid from China who could fight a little bit. But the philosopher was obtained by Master Ip. And that's what I always wanted to be. I wanted to be a Bruce Lee factory and just produce all-time greats in in the way that Master Ip, at Master Ip did. So. You didn't want to be a king. You wanted to be a king maker. That's pretty attractive. Yeah, I totally see the appeal of that. And <laughs> I will say, okay, I don't feel comfortable saying that you 100% need a mentor in order to reach your, your maximum creativity capacity. Because you know Absolutely. me, I don't, I don't like speaking in absolutes unless we're trying to have a hot take discussion. Absolutely. On which case it's done deliberately. Um, I know personally, I wish I had a real writing mentor uh, before pursuing it, I think that it has hurt. I, like the fact that when someone asks who my mentor was and I have to say Google, like. <laughs> mm. Well, I will it, say it, this. I was into my third album almost before I met Cannabis, who was my mentor and who was my 
my creative influence for as long as I remember. Like I still, when people say, well, what got you into rap? I still remember the verse from Cannabis that got me into rap that created Graden Square. If it wasn't for this verse, Graden Square wouldn't exist in its current form, which is, you know, he, his opening line was, as the universe expands, I contemplate whether it was God or the Big Bang that made man. Sometimes I wonder how come we can't live without guns. What would have been the outcome if the South won? Like stuff like that. And I was on some like, whoa, what is this? I'm from Compton. I'm living in LA. I don't hear stuff like this. This is not stuff that comes across my desk at all. And for me, it was like a light bulb goes off. And so for, I feel like everybody needs someone to facilitate that light switch going off. But if yes. you don't get that, that doesn't mean you can't reach the point where you can turn that switch on yourself. It's just going to be yes. a lot harder. You're going to do it in a dark room. You're not going to know where the switch is. You're going to have to feel around a lot. You're going to have to fall, bump into stuff. And then you might get the switch. You might not. It's much more. But I feel like with, a, with an instructor, with a teacher, with a Sifu, he or she is going to bring the best out of you. That is what their function is. Yes, I completely agree. And I mean, they're not meant to be there forever. And I, I will also say, I think, I think finding a good mentor is obviously important. Um, just take a look at any uh, work of fiction uh, that falls on the hero's journey. Like in order for the protagonist to reach their potential, they have to find that mentor figure. Mm. Um, so I do think that at the very least it helps. But I think the primary, for, for one, you can possibly have multiple mentors. I think you can level up um, in a way. I'm not saying that that's attractive or something you should pursue. But I, I think that like another issue that could arise is someone is so desperate to find a mentor, maybe they stumble upon a bad mentor and they need to get out of that situation because that can do some serious damage. But I guess what I will say is one of the primary functions of a mentor too is to just give you something to believe in and to pursue. And then it's for you to either grow out of or take to another level. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. And for most people, I don't know if they'll realize their potential because most instructors and teachers don't have the ability to maximize the potential of their students. You can teach people. But that doesn't mean you can maximize uh, the, the potentiality of that student. And I feel like the best teachers are able to do that. So for all those who are listening right now, if you are looking for a mentor, try to find someone that you can actually connect with and, and find someone who's flawed. I think that's the, my advice to anybody who's listening, looking for a mentor. Don't find someone who's perfect because that person's never going to want to teach you. you. And you're never going to live up to and that they're person lying. anyway. Yeah, exactly. And they're it's... fucking lying. So get the fuck away. <laughs> uh, but I think that wraps us up. Thank you for joining us today. This was episode nine of the Gray and Gold podcast. I'm RK Gold. My name is Graydon Square. Thank you guys for joining us. Peace, peace.